So next we're going to talk about uh, a few ways that you can connect to NERSC. So we're going to talk about three ways you can connect to NERSC services. And then we're going to talk about uh, three more ways that you can connect to Cori itself. So the three services that we'll talk about are Iris for managing your account and project, help for getting support, and my.nurse.gov, which is a portal to everything, including the current center status. So starting out with Iris, and Quentin spoke a bit about this just before. This is the first place that you will go when you get a new account. And you know, very important URL to remember, it's quite easy, iris.nurse.gov. It looks like this, and this highlighted red bit is very important for if you have any trouble with your account. If you're stuck on anything, this will solve a lot of problems. From here, you can reset your password. Uh, you can get a reset link if you've uh, forgotten your username using your institutional email. Or if you've lost your MFA tokens, for instance, your, uh, your something happened to your phone, uh, you can recover from here as well. So when you click the login button, you get a screen that looks a little bit like this. This is our single sign-on screen. You'll see this screen with quite a lot of nurse services. Uh, not quite all yet, but the majority of uh, services are behind the single sign-on window. So the first time that you log in, when you haven't, uh, when you've just got a new account, uh, this will be all you need: username and password. But very soon after that, uh, you'll find that you're using MFA for everything. So MFA is multi-factor authentication, and you're going to use it a lot at NERSC, and I suspect that if you're not already using it a lot outside of NERSC, you probably will in the you know, not too distant future. So multi-factor authentication means that you're using both your password, so something you know, and your phone or some other device or something you have. It means that if somebody finds out your password, that's not enough to hack your account. And this protects NERSC users from things like, you know, this recent uh, event, which is you know, something like 11 supercomputers across the world were hacked and NERSC was not one of them. And we suspect that a, you know, a significant aspect of why NERSC was protected was that MFA made it just that bit too difficult. So to set up MFA, in Iris, first of all, what you'll need is a device to get your token from. And we're using Google Authenticator. There is also an option B for if you don't have a smartphone or if you want a backup in case you lose your smartphone, which is authy.com. So it's available, Google Authenticator is available in the Google Play Store and also the iTunes Apple Store. Uh, there's some links here in the slides. There's also some links in our docs. There's quite a detailed walkthrough of how to set it up on our docs pages. So if you go to docs.nurse.gov and do a search in the search box for MFA, you'll find a screen that looks something like this. Then the next thing that you'll need to do is to set up your MFA tokens in Iris. So for that, you'll navigate to the MFA tab, click on the add token button and you'll get a screen it looks a bit like this. And with this, you can use Google Authenticator on your phone to scan this QR code to add it there. Or if you're using Authy, you can paste in this Authy code down here. After you've set it up, then the next time that you log in at the single sign-on page, as well as your username and password, so we saw this screen before, you'll also be asked for a one-time password which is uh, six digits that come from the app. We have a short video of what it looks like here. This is using Authy on the desktop just to be able to see what's going on. So click through the username and password, one-time password, select the number from Authy, paste it in, see the number matches, and you're in. And once you've logged into one of our single sign-on services, uh, using this screen that will actually cover you for all of them. A few key troubleshooting things. If you find you can't log into Iris, the most common thing here is that you have a new account and it can take, you know, it's not immediately approved. 
It might be that you're just still waiting in the queue for, for your account to be available. It can take, it can take some time. Um, if you've forgotten your password, you haven't logged in for a long time, or you've lost your phone or you know, your MFA tokens in some way, don't forget there's links on the IRIS login page. You can click through on those to uh, you know, solve most of the, the most common problems that people tend to have. Another one that pops up a bit is I can log into Iris, but I can't log in to Corey what's going on. And this is because when you get a new account, uh, you have a NERSC account, but to log into Corey, you need to actually be part of a project. So for that, you can check if you're part of a project by looking at the roles tab within Iris. And if the answer is no, then what you'll need to do is contact your PI and ask to be added to the project. This doesn't happen automatically at the end of a year. The PI needs to uh, remember to uh, re-enroll their members. So that was Iris. Next thing is getting help. So uh, HTTP help.nurse.gov will help you to contact nurse support. You go through the same single sign-in as you do for Iris. And then when you uh, arrive, you get a screen that looks something like this. Actually, it's a slightly different color scheme now. We've uh, just recently had an update that, that matches the nurse color scheme a, a little bit more closely, but this is kind of what the page will look like. A couple of important links that will help is over here, request forms. So if you need something sort of specific, you know, uh, something about your quotas or reservation, kind of special requests, uh, you can go to request forms. The one that you'll more commonly use is submit a ticket. So if you're stuck and need help from the uh, nurse consultants, you can submit a ticket and uh, so we will uh, be with you soon to answer your questions. We're also trialing. Uh, you can see uh, help.nurse.gov is our address. It's a little bit small here, but that actually maps across to a ServiceNow uh, location, which is nurse.services and servicenowservices.com. If you add SP after that, just at the moment, we're trialing a new service portal, which I, I don't have a, uh, a screenshot of, but it's a, a rather nicer interface that we're hoping will become our default then. And so for the final means of connecting to nurse services, and perhaps the most important, my.nurse.gov, which gives you the center status and a portal to everything. So you've seen a lot of URLs this session already uh, and today, and uh, you'll see a lot more. If you only remember one of them, remember this one, because this one will get you pretty much everywhere. My.nurse.gov. When you go there, you see a screen that looks something like this. Uh, so this one's after logging in because it's showing my personal disk usage over here, but just as a, a quick snapshot of what you get on the, uh, on the dashboard here, you can see how much of your disk quota you're using in the home and scratch file systems. Over here on the right hand side, you can see an overview of the system status. So if, if you can't log into Cori, maybe, maybe Cori is having a maintenance today and it's not available. You can check your calendar and you can check on my.nurse.gov and see if there's any issues and with a number of the other systems and services as well. Then over here on the left, we've got a bunch of menu tabs that take you to other important places at NERSC. So help.nurse.gov, which we just talked about for service tickets, jupiter.nurse.gov, which is a uh, you know, very nice product of its own right. And also a way that you can connect to NERSC and get a terminal, which we'll talk about soon, we'll have a, a bigger session on later www.nurse.gov, which is NERSC's homepage, docs.nurse.gov, which is our documentation. Highly recommend remembering that one as well, but of course you can get there with my.nurse.gov and iris.nurse.gov, which you've uh, seen a few times now. So most of the information that you see in nurse.gov, or my.nurse.gov, uh, does need a login because you know, a lot of it's attached to your account. So this one's it's a different, um, a different setup to the single sign-on. It looks basically the same. So you still put in your username, your password, and the MFA token, you use it in the same way. 
once you're in, uh, yeah, I'd encourage you to explore this menu of uh, you know, reports and uh, links on the left hand side here because there's uh, a lot of interesting information about Corey and uh, you know, useful tips and job history and so on that you can browse through. A couple of particularly useful ones. If you're wondering why your job's taking a long time to start, you can take a look to see the queue backlog, which shows the amount of work that's queued up at the moment um, for different parts of the machine. Uh, you can also see what's the typical queue wait times given a, you know, a size and um, scale of a job. Another really useful one that, uh, along here is this job script generator. So if you're trying to work out you know, what you need to put in your job scripts to make it run, that can give you a pretty good starting template. So recapping, we've gone through three ways to access NERSC services. iris.nurse.gov for your account and project, help.nurse.gov to contact support, and my.nurse.gov, which is the address to remember to get to pretty much everything else. Having talked about NERSC services, now we'll talk about some ways to connect to Corey and Again, we have uh, three ways that you can do this. You can SSH in from a terminal for power users. You can get a effectively a terminal from the browser through Jupyter. And you can use a product called No Machine, also known as NX, uh, for making GUI apps work a little bit more smoothly. So if you're running something like MATLAB or a debugger, this can be very helpful. So first up, ssh-l minus name corey.nurse.gov. If you are, this is, this is the old school traditional method of connecting to a Linux server. Um, if you're comfortable working in a terminal, ssh from your local terminal to Cori is far and away the most flexible and powerful working environment. You know, those of us who spent a lot of time in a terminal find it very difficult going back to something else. Most importantly, you'll need a terminal program. If you use a Mac on your desktop or laptop, uh, there's a, a built-in terminal. You can also download a, a app called iTerm2, which is an improved version of the terminal. I highly recommend it. It's, that's very nice. If you use Windows on your laptop or desktop, you'll need PuTTY or some equivalent. So PuTTY is sort of the most common and I guess traditional way of getting these terminals. Uh, XWin32 is also good. Uh, Git Bash is newer and quite a convenient way of getting a terminal. Uh, this link down here, I think, takes you to Putty. If your desktop or laptop is Linux, you probably already have your own favorite terminal and uh, you know how to use this already. If you're using a Chromebook, which is uh, getting more popular, if you're in developer mode, there's a thing called Crush, which gives you a, a terminal access. There's also, uh, I think, uh, a little bit more new, Crostini. Google for this one. It's Linux in a container that runs on your Chromebook. Um, it, yeah, it gives you really quickly and easily uh, a Linux environment and your Chromebook is great. Uh, or you can download, or it might be already included, the SSH app and use that to connect. So when you connect, this is what it looks like. This particular uh, screenshot is from iTerm2 on a Mac. So you'll type in ssh-l for login name and then your nurse username. Uh, we'll come back to dash y. Corey.nurse.gov is the name of the machine that you're trying to log into. And the first time you log in, you'll get a warning something like this. The, auth the authenticity of host Corey.nurse.gov can't be established. Key fingerprint, are you sure? So what does this mean? SSH prints this message when it doesn't recognize the computer that calls itself Cori. So if this is the first time you've ever logged into Cori, that's to be expected. You know, it's, it's just meeting it, it doesn't recognize it yet. If you've been logging into Cori every day for the last week, and then today you get this message, that's a red flag. Something, something's gone wrong, why, why doesn't Cori look like it used to? So when you see this message, uh, what can you do? How do you how do you decide whether or not you can continue connecting? This is where this uh, fingerprint is quite handy. 
So each Linux uh, system has kind of a, a unique fingerprint that can be only generated by that system. And the way that your laptop through SSH decides that it can recognize Corey or not is it compares the fingerprint against the one that it kept from previously. Every now and then these fingerprints do change, particularly just after a maintenance. Um, in some cases, the update to Corey will result in a different fingerprint. So to uh, give you a secure way of making sure that you're connecting to what you think you're connecting to, we publish the key fingerprints for NERSC systems on docs.nurse.gov. So it says this web address, which will take you there, or you can just go to docs.nurse.gov and in the search box type fingerprints and you should find it. So once you've gone there, you'll see a page that looks something like this, a Cori fingerprint, and you can kind of eyeball it. It looks like the same fingerprint. Yep, that's good. I can safely log in. If it's a different fingerprint, please contact us. That means that, that most likely means potentially means that somebody is out there trying to do harm and you know, we would like to stop that. So when you're connecting with SSH, you'll SSH in, uh, lots of text will go by with you know, disclaimers and, and what have you. And then you'll see a screen that looks a bit like this. It says login connection to host Corey something, password plus OTP. So what you'll do here is you'll enter your iris password followed by the digits, the six digits that came from Google Authenticator with no spaces in between. So if your password is QWERTY, which I hope it isn't, and Google Authenticator has these numbers, you'll type all in a single string, QWERTY 687921. And as you type, nothing will appear on the screen. It'll look like nothing's happening. Uh, this is a, a little bit disconcerting the first time you see it, but it's actually normal. This is the way or a way that SSH um, adds extra layers of protection to your password. It doesn't even show how many characters are being printed or are being entered. If you get a, a, a login prompt that says password, but doesn't say anything about OTP, what this probably means is that your account isn't ready yet. So it hasn't asked for your OTP because it doesn't know about it, uh, which in most cases means that it's not any. So we kind of glossed over that SSH-Y option. What's, what's that all about? SSH takes uh, a couple of options, either dash Y or dash X. Dash Y can be a, a little bit more reliable. And what this does is it allows X programs, X is the name of the Linux uh, GUI system, to run and display on your local screen. So because you know, Corey is somewhere you know, deep at NERSC and your local screen is on your desktop, so there needs to be some sort of a system where if you're running MATLAB on Cori, it can draw on your screen and X is the protocol that allows that to happen. For it to work, you need an X server. So the X client is the program, you know, MATLAB or debugger that's running on Cori, and the X server is the window that's drawing the X windows. Um, and so that runs on your laptop. If you're using a Mac, X quartz is good. If you're using Windows, SIGWIN is good. Here's the catch though. If you're outside of the building at NERSC and you're on a slow network, it can be quite painfully slow. So we're gonna talk about some alternatives to that fairly soon. Okay, after you've logged in a few times, you'll notice that you start getting a little bit tired of typing your password and looking up the one-time password every time. So there is a way to make this a little bit easier. So we have a, a tool called sshproxy.sh, which you can find by searching for MFA SSH at docs.nurse.gov. What SSH proxy does is it makes a short-term certificate that lasts for 24 hours. So you type in your password and one-time password just once, and then you don't need to type it in again from that uh, machine for the next 24 hours. So this helps to give a balance of both the protection of MFA, but um, with you know, significantly more convenience. So this is what it looks like after you've downloaded it and set it up. If you're running from a uh, Mac, for instance, you'll type 
sshproxy.shell-u in your username. It will ask for your password and OTP. You do exactly the same as if it was at the login prompt of Corey, one after the other, no spaces, nothing will appear at the prompt. And it will set up a key and it will put it by default, it will call the key NERSC in this hidden .ssh directory. You can then use that key to log in. So notice now ssh-i and the path to the key in Cori. Notice you're not putting your username anymore, you're just using the key. Or simpler still, you can add it to your keychain with the dash a option. So ssh proxy dash a and your username, log in, and then in the case of a Mac at least, it will remember you know, who you are and what your SSH um, certificate is. And then all you need to do is, oops, SSH-L, your username, Corey.nurse.gov, and it will associate with the uh, key that's saved in your keychain. If you're using Windows, we uh, now support Windows with SSH proxy. Uh, the executable is called sshproxy.exe. For detailed instructions, again, look at docs.nurse.gov, do a search for Windows SSH proxy. To use it, you'll first need to start a command prompt, which you can do by typing CMD in the search box on Windows. And this is the sequence of commands you'll use. So you'll run SSH proxy with your username. And then, so this is using PuTTY to handle the key management. Um, there's a, a tool within PuTTY called pagent. So when you run SSH proxy, it will give you a key, which will be called something like nurskey.ppk. Use pagent to pick up that key. And then you can run PuTTY using that agent to log in. So let's say you come in through a terminal, kind of the, the traditional way. A newer way that's very convenient is to use Jupyter and Jupyter gives you both notebooks and also terminals through your browser. So you can use a browser as your sort of point of contact for everything. And we, we have a, a more detailed session on Jupyter coming up soon, but I'll do a quick walkthrough first of uh, how you can access the terminal through Jupyter. So you can access Jupyter and Cori via it uh, by pointing your browser at jupyter.nurse.gov you'll see something that looks like this. Uh, notice this is a little bit similar to the MyNurse one. It's not the single sign on that Iris uses, but it's the same principle. You put your username, your password, and the OTP from Google Authenticator. That will take you into Jupyter Hub, and you'll have various options of what you can start. And in most cases, what you want to do is you want to start a session on Cori on a shared CPU node. This, this should be your default. So this starts a session on uh, something that's um, pretty much the same as the login nodes. So it's a, a fairly beefy server that has a you know, direct connection to Cori. Once you've logged in, you'll get this launcher with all these different things that you can start. And the one that we're going to talk about here is this one right down the bottom under other, you can start a terminal. And it will look like this. And it's exactly the same as a terminal that you SSH'd into, but you haven't had to you know, jump through the SSH hoops. So particularly if you're just starting out or you don't have a, a terminal set up that you're comfortable with and you only occasionally need to log into Cori to use the terminal, Jupyter can be a, a great option for that. Finally, no machine for if you're running GUI apps. And you'll notice that the web address here says NX. Uh, no machine and NX tend to be used interchangeably I think the history is that it used to be called NX and it changed its name to No Machine some years back. So if you're running a GUI app such as uh, MATLAB or a debugger such as DDT or VTune performance analysis, yeah, these are, are quite handy. They give you a nice graphical interface, but over a long network, they can be painfully slow. So we're going to talk briefly about why this is and how we can fix it. This is uh, referencing back to that. This is H-Y that we talked about before. So the reason is that when you're running a GUI application on this you know, distant um, Cori system, you're using a client server kind of architecture where the GUI application, which is the X client, is running on one system 
and it's sending messages to the X server, which is the window manager, which is running on your laptop. And the protocol that it uses, the X protocol, is very chatty. It sends a lot of traffic. And you know, if you're on a fast network, like the one internally at NERSC, this is fine, you don't notice it. But the internet out there is not all a fast network. And so all this traffic goes outside of NERSC, hits the internet, and just jams up like the Bay Bridge in the morning. And it's, uh, you know, it can be really quite slow. You know, the further, the further you are on the network, the uh, more painful you'll find the GUI experience. So the way that No Machine solves this is we actually run the windowing system on a virtual machine inside of NERSC. So it's got a fast network that the X protocol can talk over. And then NX uses a much a slimmer, faster protocol to communicate with the client that's running on your laptop. This has also got another nice little side effect, which is the internet out there is a little bit fragile. Connections break sometimes. Um, your Wi-Fi might fall over. In the normal course of things, if you're running uh, your X server on your laptop and your network falls over, that breaks your application. So you might not quit. With NX, because you're running the window manager inside of NERSC, the part that's at risk of breaking is this part out here. And okay, your connection to your session falls over, but it's still running inside of NERSC in this virtual machine. You can just reconnect it and the window comes back up and you've got your application still running exactly as you left it. So there's a few steps involved in setting it up. We have detailed instructions at this address on docs.nurse.gov. You can go to the search box and look for NX or no machine and you should find it fairly, fairly easily. Uh, in a nutshell, you need to download the client. Make sure that you get the client, not the server or the workstation. You're trying to run the client on your laptop. Then you'll need to set up a connection and we've got uh, you know, a video tutorial that you can watch for that. And then once it's set up, so you can set it up to use this SSH proxy, but you don't have to. In the example, with, if you're not using SSH proxy, the way you log on looks like this. So you get a, a log on screen, which will ask for your username and password. And this is where, this is the kind of the, the trick to remember. It's asking for your password, but it actually needs both your password and the MFA token. Uh, this is because the NX client, the machine client, it you know, doesn't actually know about MFA, it's sort of kind of hidden behind. So you put your password and your numbers here. No, no actual text will appear, it will just be dots. This is just an example of what it looks like. Very important, don't save this password to the connection file because this password includes the one-time password from Google Authenticator, which changes every 60 seconds. So, you know, it'll, uh, you don't want to save that to your connection file and try to reuse it, it won't work the same time. Once you've logged in, you'll get a screen that looks like this. So you can create a new virtual desktop. If you already had one running, it will give you the option of connecting to it. And when you connect to it, you'll see something kind of like this. So you'll, uh, this green button up here opens a terminal window on Cori. We go straight there. And just to show off that you, know, you can use this for X applications. You know, X term is a X terminal type external started in the background and you see this window pop up. And that will give you a much smoother, faster, nicer environment for running X programs. So we've run slightly over, but uh, I think we were scheduled for a, for a break to what we covered in this session. We talked about three ways you can, can connect to NERSC services. Iris, which is your first stop for managing a common project help.nurse.gov for your, uh, contacting support and my.nurse.gov, the one URL to remember for sender status and uh, portal to pretty much everything else. That's for nurse services. We've also talked about how to connect to Cori itself. You can use SSH through a terminal. You can get a terminal in your web browser via jupiter.nurse.gov. 
or if you're using GUI apps, setting up no machine client on your laptop and connecting through no machine is highly worthwhile. So that's all for connecting to NERSC for today. You got a few questions. Most of them are answered by the staff already on the Google Doc. Um, two more here, just for you to answer. So when using sshproxy.sh, what does the dash A flag do? Uh, so the dash A flag adds it to your keychain. So if you're using a, a Mac and you're familiar with the keychain, um, what it does underneath is it starts or connects to the SSH agent that's running on your laptop and adds the key to that agent. So it basically tells your laptop to remember this key for this session. So you don't need to tell it to use this identity. So, so what that saves you from doing is typing that uh, dash I, let me jump back to that slide, that looks like. So if you don't add it to the keychain, then you need to explicitly tell SSH which identity you're logging in as by pointing at as the uh, SSH key that SSH proxy generated. Adding it to your keychain kind of does that automatically. Yeah, adds the identity to for, for Glory to what your laptop is already remembering. Okay, let's save the other question um, to be answered um, on Google uh, on Google Doc uh, by written answers, uh, so that we could have more time. Uh, so it's related to Jupyter and NX. We'll, add, we'll ask the uh, Jupyter experts to answer that. There's also a Jupyter session in the afternoon. So let's take a break now. <laughs>